I'm a Kent County farmer and uh, owner and operator of a nonprofit organization that is focused on the healing the divisions that exist in politics. And I never thought that I was running for office again. I had a long history of working in politics that I'm really proud of that uh, portion of my career. And I, I thought that work was um, my crowning achievement and that I was semi-retired on my farm. That work ranged from being a city councilwoman, uh, a congressional staffer at the federal level for a number of years. I was John Kerry's domestic policy director for uh, four years before, during, and after his presidential run. And I got frustrated when I was working for Senator Kerry about what we weren't getting done in the Congress and started to think about, well, maybe if I ran for and won a seat in the state legislature, I could get some of these laws that I was working with him to try to pass at the national level. Maybe we could get it done in Maryland first. So I spent eight years as a legislator and focusing on health care is a policy area that has always been an area of expertise of mine. And one of the first laws that I passed in Annapolis was a law that allows young adults to stay on their family's health plan until they're 25 years old. We showed in Maryland how important it was to give families that kind of health security and financial security. And it became a roadmap for the Affordable Care Act when that was passed at the national level. It was folded in and is now a national law. We also pushed through in one passage of legislation that I called Kids First. It is a unique way to find and enroll more children into health insurance in our state. It also has become uh, a pathway to um, replicate at the national level. They're trying to push through in Congress right now some provisions that are similar to our Maryland laws that are about expediting enrollment for children and families. And I worked a lot on, on the environment. I pushed through legislation to protect us from the dangers of fracking for natural gas in the western part of our state made it a bipartisan initiative, ultimately getting Governor Hogan to agree with banning it, even after he ran on a campaign supporting fracking. You can get people to change their positions and find common ground when you do your homework and do your research. And I spent three years working on um, a governor's commission to evaluate the health and environmental and other um, safety concerns related to it, and we were able to make a case and, and get Governor Hogan to come on the side of banning it. Um, so healthcare, the environment, and small business and middle class family issues were things that I worked on um, at the in the state legislature. They're issues I'm focusing on now in this congressional campaign. And my legislative career has, as I mentioned, en encapsulated everything from federal, state, and local um, policy making. And I'm excited to have an opportunity now to bring that to bear for us here in the 1st Congressional District. I wasn't planning on running for Congress, but who among us would have thought that the events of January 6th would have ever taken place? I had no intention of ever running for office again. And on the day that that happened, um, my wife and I were incredibly emotionally impacted, just like everyone else that was um, so uh, devastated by watching what it meant to have a, a domestic insurrection against our, um, our democracy in the Citadel of our democracy in, in this Capitol building where uh, my spouse and I both had, had worked for a number of years. And then it was the contrast of that happening with our congressman inciting it, encouraging it through his vote to reject the election results, even though all evidence had pointed to it being a free and fair election. And getting into such an argument with a colleague on the House floor that he had to be separated before there was a fist fight at a time when we should have been coming together to heal. Mm -hmm. I knew that it was time for me to step back in, to hold him accountable, and to um, give people a reason not just to fire Andy Harris, but to be excited to hire me. And that's the thing that I'm finding in this campaign is that it isn't just about his horrible votes or his extreme antics that are embarrassing us. 
people are frustrated about having a lousy congressman who doesn't show up, who doesn't listen, who doesn't do the work. And that is the other piece of this to me, which is I was mad enough and angry enough. And anger is a really great uh, motivator. It gets us off the couch. It inspires us to do important things. And that anger over January 6th got me into the race. And it was the initial animating force. But what I wake up every day now excited to do is to roll up my sleeves and get good work done for our communities. My priority number one is always going to be our economy. As a matter of fact, my plan to address growing the economic opportunities in our region is called Economy First. It is a plan that covers 10 different sectors. Uh, any interested viewers can read the plan in all 34 pages uh, at our website at heathermazier.com. Um, I cover everything from the current challenges of inflation and how we address that, small businesses and middle class relief, um, manufacturing and construction, a section that I call make more on the shore. Uh, we also need to have 21st century skills for a workforce that is better trained and educated for the jobs that are available and that we can, then that we are targeting to go after as as regional um, opportunities for the eastern shore i'm taking the infrastructure package the 1.9 trillion dollar infrastructure package that was passed at the federal level which andy harris voted against and i've dissected it uh, to lay out all the funding opportunities for our region on addressing the rural broadband divide, on uh, fixing more of our roads and bridges, on addressing transit challenges for the Eastern Shore, rural issues that often get ignored, um, cybersecurity and defense industries, commercial fishing and aquaculture, uh, agriculture and forestry, the arts. All of these contribute to uh, an important um, interconnected dynamic for our region's economy. And what my plan does is not so much a, a spending blueprint, but it's a blueprint for how we are going to go after and get our fair share of money that Congress has already decided to allocate. And when we don't have a congressman right now who is engaged in these issues, we continue to lose out. I dare say that in the development of this plan, I have spent more time thinking about our region's economic future than Andy Harris has done in the 12 years, nearly 12 years that he has represented us. And, and the way that I developed that plan came from the way I believe we must govern, which is engaging stakeholders, being in the community, doing tours, meeting with small business owners, listening to people about what the biggest challenges are. One of the sleeper issues that I hear about more than any other issue is the lack of affordable housing in our region. And the housing and community development section of our plan um, I propose a, a renter's tax cut, um, the, a tax credit that could be used and applied into a, um, a savings plan that would uh, take that tax credit and give it, uh, in addition to it being a tax credit, give it an advantaged um, uh, treatment that would uh, allow people to save more money towards a mortgage. Um, workforce housing is a challenge throughout our region, particularly in Ocean City. And I propose a, a, a plan in collaboration. There's a private-public partnership opportunity for creating dormitory-style seasonal housing in West o Ocean City, but they don't. They're looking for a funding partner, and I am promoting in this plan a way that the federal government and that the, and the state can come together to help bring an initiative like that forward. But I also discovered in my meetings with the Talbot Interfaith. Uh, shelter and other homeless shelters and 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 realizing how much the silent epidemic of homelessness is gripping us here on the shore as I researched our options for getting more federal funding for that I discovered that rural homeless funding has never ever been implemented or funded through the federal programs we're ignored it's funding that is under the housing and urban development uh, department and the, the rural programs just uh, tend not to 
be focused on uh, in housing. There's like this wrong assumption that homelessness is just a challenge for the cities. And, and it sadly is something that we're dealing with more and more throughout the first congressional district. And so the plan that I've put together is about engaging stakeholders, really being on top of what are the biggest challenges that we're facing, and then using my experience as a consensus builder to find common solutions to our toughest challenges. And that's why this campaign is resonating with Republicans and Democrats and independents alike, because I'm about getting the job done for us rising above partisan and ideological fights and just getting good things done. So I'm focusing on the economy as my top priority. And then my second area of focus is the climate crisis, but particularly to our region, making our farmers part of the climate solution. For too long, environmentalists and farmers and the agricultural community have been at odds about these issues. We don't have to be. And I personally embody bringing all of that together. I'm the daughter of multi-generation farming family, and I'm also an environmentalist, and I'm proud to have the League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Clubs backing in this race. 98% uh, lifetime rating in, in voting with the environment when I was a member of the legislature. But my first instinct on how to address the climate crisis wasn't just to go to um, conversations about the proposals that are already being discussed in Congress. I wanted to have a dialogue about what's our unique solution to our needs here. We sit on thousands of miles of coastline and um, we have so many um, negative impacts of rising sea uh, levels, um, coastal mitigation of the, of the flooding, saltwater intrusion on our agricultural lands, what could we do to come up with a proposal that bridges those concerns? And our agri-climate plan is a plan that does that. We stand on a giant carbon sink, which is the ground. If we were to incentivize farming practices, regenerative farming practices, that um, are encapsulated in a national soil health initiative that we're proposing, we can pay farmers for sequestering carbon in the soil. And this is not just a made up potential opportunity. We have some very innovative farmers right here in Kent County who are already doing this. Trey Hill at Harborview Farms in Rock Hall is already being paid in the budding new um, carbon credit markets for doing this kind of farming. But most farmers aren't doing it because there aren't enough incentives aligned to encourage it to be done. Federal policy encourages all kinds of activities in the Farm Bill. We can come together and, and propose through this National Soil Health Initiative growing that practice. We can also tie good climate practice to um, crop insurance premiums and, uh, and have an innovative approach to addressing the challenges of the chicken litter that's been going into uh, our bay and polluting our waterways. And so on all these issues, um, it's hard for me to pick among them. Um, as you can tell, I feel very passionate about so many of these issues. If we had longer time, I would talk to you about the ideas that have come to me from working with our watermen on addressing the H2B visa crisis in, in the industry and addressing uh, improving uh, dredging and, and cleaning up our waterways as a way to um, protect that important livelihood in our district. So I really one of the greatest contrasts between me and Andy Harris is our willingness to collaborate and work with friends and colleagues across the aisle to get good things done. The Luger Center just recently put out its bipartisan index and it rates every single member of Congress. The bottom 10 members who are most divisive, most extreme, include Andy Harris along with nationally recognized other extremists like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is not um, something that should be celebrated in our district. When you are that extreme and you are that unwilling to work with your colleagues to get anything done, you don't deliver for your district. You're not representing the people who live in your communities. 
I pride myself on my history throughout my legislative service of building friendships and alliances and toning down the partisan rhetoric in order to get good things done. You know, the number one threat to our national security is our polarization. What happened on January 6th, as horrible as it is, is not just a lone incident. It's this incident that is a reflection of the division that exists deep among us in all of our communities. We've become so polarized that we're so ready to just fight with somebody about what we think and believe instead of opening ourselves to really listening about how someone may disagree with us. I always come to these conversations with honor and respect for wherever someone is in their journey. I don't judge, I don't point fingers, I don't believe in guilt and shame, I don't believe in dividing us up. I have always promoted being curious, being compassionate, being connected to each other, and then finding the common areas where there's overlap, where we can make some progress together. And then that door opening tends to open up to other progress. I've worked across the aisle in meaningful ways to expand family planning services, free family planning for all low-income women in Maryland, because I convinced a colleague of mine that we didn't have to let our differences as pro-choice or pro-life legislators get in the way of empowering women to make uh, the choice to become mothers when it works for them. That's how we lower the unwanted pregnancies is through giving free family planning to, to more people. One of the ways that I have encouraged implementing that in my campaign is through the Mazir Volunteer Corps. This is a, an initiative that we launched early on in the campaign that is about doing community service projects coming together. You don't have to vote for me. You don't have to be one of my supporters. You just have to be somebody that wants to get a good project done in your community because we don't have to wait to win an election to make a difference now.